Julian, it's great to see you. I've had the great fun of reading your book, The Janus Point, A New Theory of Time. And I was struck by the remarkable expansion of your radical ideas from last week's talk before you were just focused on time. Now you have this enormous vision, which is not only that uh, time does not flow, it, 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 not just from past to future, that what counts in the universe are shapes, which form our, our, uh, our sense of duration or time, that the history of the universe is not the traditional entropy or disorder increasing, but rather the growth of structure. You have the Big Bang being what you call the Janus point, time flowing in both directions away from it, driven by the expansion of the universe, and then your radical challenge of current belief that that there will not be a death of heat or a heat death in the universe and that life can expand without found. So if I accept all of that without uh, criticism, I now believe everything that you have in, in this grand new vision, I want to ask you what are the implications for some of the biggest ideas in physics? I want to start with the Big Bang. The Big Bang, I believe, is the most uniform state that, that the universe can have. And it just begins in the, the most uniform shape. And at least up to now, that variety, that shape gets richer and richer. And that is actually in agreement with what we see, what the astronomers tell us. Next, inflation theory. That's a theory that, uh, that what gave rise to the Big Bang prior to the Big Bang was this uh, enormous increase uh, in, in uh, the expansion of the universe within a very sh short amount of time. Uh, exponential increases, people in different numbers, 10 to the 50th or whatever. Uh, Alan Guth, Andre Lindy, others have, have contributed to this. So if what you say is true, what happens to inflation theory? This is, this is a conjectural part of my idea, but what they were really, the, the real triumph of inflation is to explain why the uh, structure, early structure in the universe had the form that it did. Yes. And that is undoubtedly a great success. As of now, there is no serious rival to inflation. What is rather intriguing, and there are diagrams in my book, which at least in Newtonian theory, suggest that if the universe comes out of a, a, a situation where the size is zero, it will come out looking very uniform, but not exactly uniform. And in fact, actually somewhat looking, actually when you look at the pictures, looking like the sort of structure that inflation is put there to explain. So the suggestion is, in, there is an alternative to in inflation, which is completely different, that the universe starts off looking very uniform, but not no, exactly no. uniform. And the deviation from exact uniformity, just as in inflation, then leads to all the structure we observe. If, if from, very primitive, from very precise first principles, we can say the universe must start with certain seeds, it must be very uniform, but not exactly uniform, and the departure from uniformity is the same as in inflation, then we have an alternative theory. And we might be able to make much more precise predictions. How about quantum gravity, the holy grail of unifying quantum theory with uh, general relativity? Well, I just uh, I put in a page and a half in the book where I make a conjecture about that. And one of the one of the really big problems in quantum gravity is what is the nature of time? And the key uh, mathematical concept in my book is, is what I call complexity. Complexity is just a measure of the variety of the universe. And people have made various suggestions for what is time. And I'm suggesting that time is lit, that complexity is time. Time is literally the complexity. So you can look at all the possible shapes of the universe and uh, put them all together, those that have the same complexity. Some, some will have more complexity than others, but there will be a whole lot that have the same, there will be a unique one where the universe starts that has the least complexity and the greatest uniformity. But after that, there will be lots that have the same uh, complexity, but are different shapes. And the quantum theory of the universe is about what are the probabilities for those different shapes. So this is actually a very precise theory. It's entirely possible it's wrong, 
but I believe it is actually the simplest and clearest and in some ways the most logical one that's been proposed so far. I, I was actually impressed by that. I don't know if I agree, but I, I was impressed. Okay, let's go on. Creation of the universe, ex nihilo, from nothing. I would say no, I would say it's there forever. I mean, the, the possible, I'm, I'm, when it comes to mathematics, I'm quite platonic. I'm hugely impressed by things like Pythagoras' theorem and, and so on. I think that there are just possible shapes. I mean, we, we, the, 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 probably the most important shape in the whole of mathematics is the triangle. The, uh, I mean, in Euclidean space, uh, all of trigonometry, the complex numbers, everything comes out of a triangle. So you can have all, for me, these triangles exist in eternity. They are there in all times. So I don't believe in creation ex nihilo. Uh, there is, here I agree strongly with Roger Penrose and Max Tegmark. I think there is, so to speak, a platonic realm of mathematical structures, which somehow or other we do experience. How about creation of the universe, but the special birth conditions uh, of, of that initial uh, condition? Well, they are just there. The, the, the space of all possible triangles, there, there is one triangle which is very special. It's the equilateral triangle. So this is my point alpha. This is the, it, this is the, this is, if, if the universe just had three particles in it, the Big Bang would be the equilateral triangle. <laughs> and we would be somewhere where, where we're looking a bit like a shard. <laughs> <laughs> with one side much shorter than the distance to the to, to the, the two distances to the other particle. How about the large scale structure of the universe? Well, uh, I've explained that with the uh, with the idea about inflation that the universe starts off with the most uniform but not completely uniform. There are seed non uniformities at, at the uh, that's not true in the equilateral triangle, except that the equilateral triangle, if you're in Newtonian gravity, the particles can have different masses. That introduces a certain amount of variety. And as soon as you get any number of particles, a few hundred, you have a lot of very interesting structure when you get to the most uniform possible shape. How about uh, defining what you call the law of the universe and why is it that, that it, such exists? That, of course, is a complete mystery. Although, well, first, for, I, I, I would, well, let's first, start by, let's start with this. What is what you call the law of the universe? I say, I conjecture that the law of the universe is that it begins with the most uniform shape subject to a certain criterion. So that I define a quantity called complexity for which there are strong mathematical arguments to take it seriously. The complexity has the least possible value. If it's just three particles, it's an equilateral triangle. If it's many particles, it's very interesting, but this, it has a very definite structure. And it's a very uniform, but not completely uniform. And from then on, you just get uh, uh, all of the possible shapes of the universe arranged successively at different times, which is just their time, is just how complex they are. But at a given time, some of have more interesting structure than others, uh, although it's the same complexity. And that complexity just goes on increasing. So the advance into the future is just the increase of that complexity. How do you undermine the conventional wisdom that we are headed for a barren universe? Because the, uh, the variety never, never gets washed out. It's, it's to do with the importance of ratios. As long as there are differences between, uh, if, if uh, I mean, think of Gulliver's travels. <laughs> you, know? uh, you can do, all sorts of things once you've got things of different size. As long as there are different sizes, there's reality, there's this possibility for sensible existence. Okay, now I'm gonna get a little bit uh, broader, um, move away from pure physics, and uh, uh, how about the concept of teleology 
Um, most physicists, as you know, would say that the universe is what it is. And uh, Steven Weinberg's famous remark that the more we understand the universe, the more we see how pointless it is. Uh, but some have pushed back against that more recently about that there may be some teleology built into it, which is usually a, a curse word in science. That's quite true. I, I touch on that uh, a bit cautiously in my book. I have to admit that the suggestion that the universe starts off in the most uniform way it possibly can, but with some seeds of non-uniformity variety and goes on getting more varied, that does look teleological. And in fact, actually, it's not far removed from what Leibniz said. Leibniz said we live, he says we live in the best of all possible worlds, but actually if you look carefully at what he really said and believed, he said that we live in the most varied of all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And actually a great scholar in Leibniz, I haven't yet managed to check it out and find the place where it is in Leibniz, but he told me, Leibniz had two ideas, either that the universe is always in its most varied state possible, or that the variety, it's, it is always increasing the variety. So this case would be exactly actually what Leibniz had conjectured uh, over 300 years ago. You no, yes, just over 300 years ago. You venture into the, uh, the swamp of uh, consciousness and the hard problem of how we understand the, our experience, subjective experience uh, with physical matter. Yes. I. I just can't do any better on consciousness than uh, what William James and quite a lot of other people, I goes back before that, uh, that uh, if we believe in an external world, and I, I certainly do believe in a, in, a, in a structured, mathematically structured external world, I just have to assume what's psychophysical parallelism. What I experience, there is a counterpart in the external world. There is, we can find a structure out there that matches what I experience. And Galileo says this very clearly back in 1623. That's, not, that. that's not saying the same thing though, that, that our consciousness so-called supervenes that's uh, on the physical uh, uh, world. Uh, uh, a parallelism is different than supervening, where one is totally dependent on the other. I would, to be honest, I think this is still so difficult. Uh, I, actually, I wish I knew much more of neuroscience because I think neuroscience may be beginning to tell us very interesting things. I mean, uh, I'm sticking my neck out enough with what I'm oh, saying. Okay. I'm not going to. I'm that's not going to pretend to tell neuroscientists what they're discovering. You know, sticking your neck out is the one of the core principles of closer to truth. So we're on we're on solid ground here. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so if, if what you say is true, how do you look at the word forever? What does that mean? That um, I don't think I don't think any conscious being is going to live forever. Um, I think that's a rather alarming thought. I mean, personally, I've, I've had a wonderful life. I'm already 83. It looks as if I've got a few more years of good quality of life. But I, you know, I, I'll settle for early 90s and, and not complain. Um, no, but it may well be that completely different form of, of awareness, I would prefer to use awareness, will, will, will be out there in the future. And of course, we don't know there might be awareness all around us of, of which we have no knowledge. I mean, I mean, in some senses, we know that trees and fungi underneath, uh, you know, are communicating. There's no question there's communication. To what extent you could call that awareness, I, I, I don't know. Let's look at some of the two maybe biggest questions that, uh, that your work uh, might impinge upon. And one is the existence of a traditional God, whether in the Western uh, personal sense or uh, the Eastern uh, more uh, uh, cosmic consciousness sense. Uh, um, if everything you say is true, are there any implications uh, to the existence of such uh, uh, supernatural uh, kinds of uh, foundational um, entities? I think, I mean, if what I'm saying is going in the right direction, I think it's too early to say. I'm. I'm agnostic. I'm, I mean, I was brought up a Catholic. I 
rejected the Catholic dogma in my teens. Then I met someone who told me to read Jesus's, uh, uh, the New Testament seriously. I was very impressed by Jesus's ethical teaching. I think it, some of it is very beautiful, things like uh, the person, the woman taken in adultery, you know, let he that is without blemish cast the first stone. Uh, for me, uh, my ideal of how I would like to live is that I, I remain otherwise agnostic. And I mean, I've had a hugely rich life. Uh, I'm immensely grateful for the life I've been able to enjoy. Um, it's I, in my first popular science book, I said being here is the supreme gift and uh, mm. it still holds true for me. How about the, what I, what we at Closer to Truth say is the biggest question of all, why is there anything at all? And if I hear what you've said, if, if the universe didn't have a beginning and, or it had this, uh, this uh, movement in both directions towards this original uh, point, whether it's, it's a zero or close to zero, um, does that answer the question, why is there anything at all? Because the answer is that it was always there by, by, by brute fact. I, I, well, this is where I come into the, my sort of platonic ideas about mathematics. I, I do, uh, just to take another example from mathematics, five and seven are prime numbers. And they, they just seem, that, that seems to be something, some truth that is there. I, uh, and I don't think seven will ever cease to be a prime number. Uh, and uh, so it, to that extent, it seems to me there is eternal existence. There is eternal existence of, of, of at least of possible structures. Uh, uh, and I, I, I can't go any better than that. Um, Julian, uh, the progress in your uh, ideas over the last uh, nine or so years since the last time, call it a decade since we met, if you have that, that same progress over the next 10 years, I want to schedule right now another session just like this and see where we've come. Oh, well, thanks very much. If these tentative ideas I have about quantum gravity are right, <laughs> it might be worth it, but they are tentative. They are tentative. But it right. will be wonderful if they're, but because it has all sorts of, fascinating possibilities. That page and a half that I put at the end of chapter 18 of my book, if they, if they come out right, that, that's going to be exciting. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.